My name is Father Anthony Connolly. I am a passionist priest. I think it's about three months old as a priest, baby priest. Um, a little bit about my family and background. I um, grew up here in Bishop Briggs, which some of you might know well, others not. <laughs> uh, I am the second of five children. Um, one of them is in the US, the rest are around Glasgow. Two, uh, two girls and three boys in the family. Older brother, two younger sisters and younger brother. I've now got nieces and a nephew on the way, and so uh, the family is growing. Um, when did I first want to become a priest? When I was eight years old, it was the year of my first Holy Communion. I remember I was living actually not in Bishop Briggs at that time. I was in Steps, which is in the Motherwell Diocese, Michelle's Diocese. Um, and I remember it was the time, 1984, gives you my age, uh, the time of the Ethiopian famine, when Bob Geldof and all the other musicians first sang that famous song, Do They Know It's Christmas? But before that, we were getting all of these news images. And I, I can remember vividly to this day walking through the house into the living room and the TV was there. And there was this first image I'd ever seen of a starving child. A little Ethiopian child with the thin, thin arms, swollen stomach, flies and snotters and everything just all about it. The eyes all crusted. I can still see that image. And at that point, an eight-year-old, I said, I want to be a priest for these people. I don't remember if I said it out loud or it was something just within. But that was the first time ever that it had occurred to me that I might become a priest. I'm 43 now, so that's 35 years ago. And as I say, I'm only a baby priest, so it took me a long while, a long number of years to get there. And we don't have time to go through everything, everything, but there'll be space for questions. So I'll give you a, a kind of rough bird's eye view of my life, maybe, and then you can come in and ask the questions that are interesting. So, as I say, I, the family, we grew up here in Bishop Briggs eventually, a year after that experience. Um, I didn't feel uh, strongly moved in any way to become a priest until I was actually nearer 30. Uh, so in that meantime, that little childhood memory of wanting to become a priest, or being called to be a priest for these poor African children as it was at the time, was always like a file at the back of my memory. It was always just there, something lingering and it affected me. It did when, when things were coming al along. Um, I thought at some point I'm going to have to pull that file out, have another read at it, if you want. So anyway, I attended Trumbull High School. I eventually went on to Glasgow University. I did uh, medical biochemistry. I, I wanted at that point to do something more with people. I wasn't too impressed with laboratory work. So I worked in a nursing home for a year. One of the most powerful experiences of my life was, you know, cleaning these old people, um, feeding them, dressing them, making their beds, buying toiletries for them, just talking to them. And it was this, as I say, a great formative experience. And it was already, I didn't think it at the time explicitly, coming into another idea of what, it, what poverty meant. It wasn't just the starving children in Africa, but there was poverty all around us. So by the end of that year, I, I thought, you know, I had thoughts of doing medicine, I had thoughts of doing nursing, working like that. But then I thought, no, I'm going to, I discovered that there was a, a master's degree in biomedical science at Strathclyde University. So 
I applied and it was, I think it was the first year they were doing it, a Master of Research. I began that. Um, at that time, I was just across the road from St Mungo's. And so if I wasn't going to Mass in my home parish of St Matthew's in Bishop Briggs, I tended to go there. And I was, by this time, I was, I was going daily. I was going daily to Mass and and St Mungo's, as you might know, also has um, two days a week of exposition of the Blessed Sacrament. So I was praying there as well. And also, uh, I would go there for confession. Um, something that, as you know, we have we devote a lot of time to confession in St Mungo's. So there I am at, uh, doing my Master's. And then a new supervisor comes in and asks me to, to begin a PhD. I I have to go through the interview and everything I do it and uh, it's also being funded by the university so I, I become what's called a graduate teaching assistant basically I have to do several hours teaching the laboratories to pay my way if you want to pay for this PhD so I, I'm doing that and uh, one day uh, a new priest had arrived assistant priest Father Eamon Freeland in St Matthews and he'd started doing the half seven mass in the morning every single day, apart from Saturday and Sunday. And so most times I was going to half seven mass, getting the bus into university, and that was that was pretty much my day. Uh, this particular morning was the 17th of January, 2005. 17th of January is actually the feast of my patron, St. Anthony of Egypt, St. Anthony of the Desert. Um, and the gospel of that day is the one actually Anthony himself would have heard and which brought about his conversion. It's the story of the rich young man. Um, what Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? As Father Friel proclaimed that gospel, which I'd heard dozens of times, something made it very personal that day. The Holy Spirit, I can only put it down to. The words that Jesus spoke were addressed to me. And when I left Mass that day, I was like almost in a way in another world. I have to give up everything now and follow Jesus and give my life, devote it to his service and to the poor. Boom, I went in. I started typing in the office a resignation letter. I was only two years into the PhD. It was a four-year PhD. And I thought, typing a resignation letter whatever it was, half eight in the morning. And then I thought, Anthony, what are you doing? Where are you going to go? What priesthood where? What on earth are you, you know, giving up all this and, you know, future, your future in academia and all these sort of things, what, you know. So anyway, I stepped back. I didn't submit my letter of resignation, but I thought I have to, I have to investigate this. Now, I was very friendly with a priest down at the cathedral at the time of Father Hugh McGinley, who's now dead, God rest him, died of cancer. He'd gone to a number, um, the, a number of events with us as young people, and, and I spoke with him, um, and he became, if you want, a spiritual director. Um, it was never kind of formalised that way, but we had our conversations about faith, about my life, about prayer, about vocation, and so you know, technically he was my spiritual director. Um, he then, through through his guidance and the Holy Spirit, I started to investigate. I investigated a number of orders, um, and I'd already done that just prior to that as well. But, um, but the one that sort of struck me was Mother Teresa's order of priests, the Missionary of Charity Fathers. Um, their only place in Europe was in Rome, so, you know, hard life that it is, I had to go to Rome for, for an experience with them, you know, such is life. We ride an air flight into Rome and two weeks with them, I spent, those two weeks blew me away. There was such a, a life of community, of prayer, and also this amazing outreach to the poor. In those two weeks, gosh, what we were doing were, it was a huge gypsy traveller camp. I mean, it was like a, a small town, a small village, 
they had electricity wires running over there. They had a bar and a pool room in this village. It was it was like a village. It was only a few hundred meters from our house, and so we we uh, you know went down there. We were praying with them, bringing them food. We were you know um, projecting the passion of the Christ onto a big white sheet in the middle of their, their village. Different things uh, with them. We went out in the streets early in the morning, uh, taking coffee and bread to, to those who were sleeping rough, finding them in all sorts of places. Uh, on a Sunday, going to one of the hospitals in Rome, Spallanzani, which is for patients with infectious diseases. So a lot of them were HIV AIDS patients. So uh, again, just you know, being with them at the side of their bed, if they were able to to take them down to Mass on the Sunday, bring them Holy Communion or whatever the, the chaplain asked us to do. So, as I say, there were lots and lots of things and it just blew me away. Um, and so when I came back, I kind of felt now, I know where I'm going. So I did the whole resignation thing at that point. Um, people weren't too happy about it, certainly, but others, others were quite, you know, moved that I would give all that up. At one point, I was tempted to step back again. And I remember it was um, Marie Claire's, one of our predecessors in the youth office, a Chris Doherty. He was, I had done some work volunteering with him in the youth office. And I said to him, I don't know if I'm making the right choice here, you know, giving up the PhD, graduate teaching assistant, everything. And he says, Anthony, I will never forget it. He says, Anthony, the world has enough PhDs, but not enough priests. <laughs> I mean, that just simple, simple thing like that just put me at ease. And so there I was. I was on the plane to Rome, back to Rome. And this was about December 2006 by this time. Um, now, I spent six and a half years as a missionary of charity, father, student. Um, I, most of the time, about four years of it was spent in Rome studying philosophy, theology. Um, I had two years of novitiate in Mexico, Mexico City. A year was kind of in-house, lockdown kind of thing. But uh, the other thing was more missionary and a year of kind of mission. Um, smaller missionary experiences in Nairobi, Kenya, Albania and other places. Um, so, you know, how did I get from missionary charity to passionist then, I suppose? Because I see the clock's ticking. Um, when I first went, I suppose it, there's a great honeymoon period, maybe it's like getting into marriage, when I, those first weeks, months out in Rome were just amazing again. But very often in the religious life and priestly formation, seminary life, once the honeymoon period's over and just the monotony, the, the community life, the difficulties in community life, when these things all suddenly just kind of, okay, kick in again, you need something a bit deeper, you know, to, to persevere, to keep going. I did, I did, I must say, but the hardest thing in those years was difficulty in prayer. I always had a most amazing experiences in prayer beforehand, you know, scripture passages just boom, really powerful, you know, that was, I needed that today, and the, praying the liturgy of the hours, the divine office, wow, you know, something from the reading touching me. I was like a dry stump out in Rome, dry stump, couldn't, couldn't experience anything in prayer, no movement whatsoever. I mean, we had about two and a half hours of adoration each day. We had mass, we had all the prayers that, that um, from the liturgy of the hours, rosaries, and, and, you know, I was there in that chapel, but I, I don't know what the others were experiencing, but I, I wasn't, I wasn't experiencing the Lord's presence at that point in prayer. However, you know, the Lord was reaching out to me in other ways, and, and it was particularly through the poor. At various times, you know, these insignificant people who maybe I, I would see regularly, other times I would have seen them once, they would say a little word, 
you know, something even as simple as, you know, thanks for that, Father. You know, I'm going to, you know, say a prayer for you. And it was touching me as only God can touch. You know, right to the depth of the heart, the soul that you know, where, where you know, gosh, God's really, you know, looking out for me. God's really present in my life. And it was coming through as I say, these these poor people, these people who I was, I was sent to serve, they were actually serving me in ways that they, they'll never know, you know, in this, this side of eternity. So, as I say, the, the it was a difficult six and a half years, um, very difficult. Another thing that happened was there was a number of people left um, because you know, disagreements with superiors and things like this and people would get into a lot of um, arguments and, and you know it's not all roses and a bed of roses and um, so different things were, were going on um, and then just about January 2012 my father died now the last time I'd seen him was nine months before and so the last nine months of his life I never saw him um, I was in Rome he was in Glasgow here um, the very last thing he said to me on the phone was in New Year's Day 2012 and he's I mean he, he should have known but he said you know are you going to be a priest soon that was the last thing he ever said to me and um, you know 19 18 days later he was gone I was in Rome and that again was a very hard hard day it was probably the only you know one of the days that I've really cried you know when I got that news on the phone Anthony sorry dad died half an hour ago just knocked me on my back. But as I went back over that day, as I say, you know, the Lord works marvels. He is present if we have eyes to see, ears to hear. There were different things happened in that day, things people said to me. And I found them strange at the time, but only with hindsight. It was, you know, you know, it was like I went into the this bookshop as I was cycling home from uni. Probably my dad was, you know, having taken his last breath at that point. I remember this poor woman looking at me, and normally these people would be asking for money. Padre, you know, give me some money. She just looked at me, sad, compassionate, with pity. And I thought, what was that all about? That time I didn't know my dad was dying or he was already dead. Only afterwards I thought, gosh, you know, what was, you know, how was God working in the heart of the soul of that woman at the time? Another nun in the university with me who had, um, she had been, she'd lost her brother. He was from Myanmar, from Burma, and she couldn't go home either. And, and I remember coming out of the uni, I said, um, you know, my dad's quite sick, uh, sister, say a prayer for him. And her face again just dropped. You know, I only asked for a prayer sister. But again, you know, it's with hindsight, these things, you, you it's seeing the Lord very present. So, as I say, I didn't have great peace around that time leading up to either. But there was a point where, before the Blessed Sacrament, I kind of feel I hit rock bottom. And I just said to the Lord, look, that's it, you know. I have nothing else to give, nothing else to try. You know, you you take over because I have nothing. And at that point, and this was about the last maybe seven, eight, nine months of my time in Rome with the missionaries, it was a profound peace. Every time I came into adoration, there was just this peace, this peace of having surrendered. That's abandoned everything. Stop trying to be in control of everything. Stop trying to control prayer. Stop trying to second guess God. Just abandoning, letting go, letting God be God. And at that point as well, I thought there was a great movement. I thought, you know, this is not where I'm called to be either. There's a, and I was confident of leaving at that point, you know, because there's a, an Ignatian principle you know, never make big choices in desolation, in a state of spiritual desolation. So that's why I had kept going. 
through all those dry years. And so at this point, I thought, and with the superiors and everyone's in agreement, I said, yeah, I can, I can go home and I can go home peacefully. I still wanted to be a priest. Didn't know, didn't know how. Anyway, I came back. I came back and of course I went to St Mungo's, not thinking of joining the Passionists at that point, going there for prayer again, going there for mass, until one of the priests who's the vocation director, Father Paul Francis, he saw me and he, he had known me from before. And he actually wanted me to join at the time when I joined the missionaries. He called me in for a chat. I started to chat with him. Eventually he was inviting me out to Ireland to vocation weekends. And from there, um, I, I discerned that this is where this community, this passionist community is where God was calling me. Um, I had to complete studies. I ended up down in London in Heathrop, the Jesuit College, before it closed. I had to do two years of theology. Um, that finished before I was in, in final vows, so they didn't know what to do with me. Uh, they sent me to Glasgow to start um, doing some char char charity work chaplaincy work at the college, City of Glasgow College, um, and then helping out at the other two universities if needed. Um, and so that's what I've been doing. And then in this June of last year, I was able to make my final vows as a passionist. A few weeks later, in Ardoin in Belfast, I went across there to be ordained a deacon. And then 21st of December in St Mungo's, I was ordained a priest. And here I am. I'm still in my honeymoon period. <laughs> things are still good. Even in lockdown, things are, God is good. You know, there's, there's wonderful things happening.